Thanks, Chris, and thanks for the promotion. I'm not really a doctor, but I got, I think I have kind of maybe the, top, the toughest talk today. You see in today's standard, EPA doesn't usually come to town without a lot of controversy. And it's not like you see newspaper headlines to stop USGS from doing the water modeling on Cement Creek or the Department Division of Reclamation of Mine Safety to stop them from doing bulkheads. EPA seems to have a lot of controversy and sometimes it's somewhat uh, you know, <clears throat> deserved, I guess. But I, w I wanted to talk a little bit about <clears throat> just the ba <clears throat> background of the Superfund program and then look at a couple sites that <clears throat> we've worked on here in Colorado just to compare two different approaches. Superfund <clears throat> came, of, came about in uh, the late 70s as a result of uh, primarily in upstate New York, the Love Canal site, which was a chemical, was a site of a hooker chemical. They were a chemical manufacturer that <clears throat> went broke or disappeared in the 1950s, and 20 years later there was res residential housing on the site where there was waste disposal and there was a lot of uh, health concerns and uh, no real mechanism to clean it up. And so in 1980, EPA or the Congress created the Superfund program to deal with these what are called abandoned hazardous waste sites, which can include abandoned mine sites. And sometimes it's uh, Superfund and mine reclamation can be considered a round peg of a square hole, and we've been trying to work through these issues and try different approaches for the cleanups. The, of course, the obvious objective of Superfund is the protection of human health and the environment. And on mining sites, we are primarily focused on the water quality issues and the results of the historic mining and their impacts on surface waters of the state. And I should say too that Superfund is almost entirely, as far as mining sites go, involved in the historic pre-law abandoned mines and very rarely do we get involved in actual permitted mines or mines that have come about since there's been the uh, permitting and bonding process, one of the few exceptions was the Summitville site down in San Juan's. A big component of the Superfund <coughs> is involving the communities, and that's all the way from uh, its listing, as there's been some talk about it in Silverton, <coughs> through the completion of the construction. So community input is a huge component, and as you well saw in today's paper too, that uh, EPA is not pushing forward listing of Superfund sites unless there is a, a consensus within the community as well as the governor's office that uh, will concur with this listing. We also are work with the federal agencies, state agencies, and the responsible parties to implement the cleanups. And when you get up into these mining districts, there's a number of state and federal agencies also involved and up here of course BLM is a real active partner in these cleanups as well as Sunnyside. You know, I think um, our good friend gave a pretty good talk about Superfund. He even knew the what our acronym CERCLA stood for, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, which I was impressed he said. And uh, the joint and severable liability goes with it. And that's a, uh, again, when Congress created Superfund, they wanted the polluters to pay. And so it was a, uh, you know, enforcement part of Superfund that's given it some of the stigma or some of the bad rap. And I do say we do, are trying to use some discretion in how we use that and primarily are looking at, you know, the active operators for these abandoned hazardous waste sites and trying to work with them towards a settlement. And then of course the other big component is returning land to positive reuse. And that's a big piece that we try to work through that we're 
I'm not just able to uh, clean up the water or deal with contaminated soils, but that there is the opportunity for reuse of it, whether it's, I work up in the Clear Creek watershed. We have Casino call me yesterday and ask it about building a uh, hotel on a tailing pile and how that would work with the Superfund program. And I told him probably more than working with the Superfund program is the geotechnical constraints of building a hotel on a tailing pile. Because we, we do try to work on with private parties and uh, local governments on re positive reuse of these properties, including bringing back mining if that's a viable option too. In Region 8, our, our six state region, we have 66 sites. About half of them are, have been completed, and about half are former mining sites. In Colorado, we have six sites with active water treatment plants. They're all the standard lime precipitation plants, and of those, we've got two of them, the state of Colorado and EPA are funding with one more that's online in Blackhawk that we're scheduled to build before we get funding. And then the remainder are just your more classic Superfund sites, the industrial facilities that can be anything from a city block size of an abandoned industrial facility to a lot of the old municipal landfills around the country. I wanted to <coughs> talk briefly about two different sites that I work on here in Colorado and different approaches we have for listing the Superfund sites. One of them is <coughs> the Clear Creek watershed above Denver, which when we named that in, uh, I believe, 1983, we basically named the entire 400 square mile watershed going all the way up to Eisenhower Tunnel and Berthoud Pass, <coughs> all the way down to Golden, just west of Denver, as a study area. And that encompassed, I've heard something around 1,200 or more abandoned waste rock piles and uh, a number of draining mine addicts. And within that, we also have then uh, <coughs> one of the big pieces of that cleanup was in 1996, we put online the Argo water treatment plant. And again, the Argo is your standard light precipitate plant, treats the, whoops, I'll do like everybody else and mess up the pointer. <clears throat> the Argo tunnel back here, which was, again, an ore haulage and uh, to drain the mines going four miles back towards Central City, we drained numerous mines. It's this vast network of, my, of <clears throat> mines that it drained, and it all came out here, so we, built the lime precipitate plant and you get, with those plants, you get immediate results. You're taking you know, the zinc load coming out of this draining mine tunnel and immediately removing the zinc. The cost of these plants is today generally around $15 million to build and their costs are plus or minus you know, several hundred thousand dollars but around a million dollars a year to operate and then you of course got your daily amount of sludge like this plant produces about one roll off dumpster a day of sludge that has to also be managed. So you do have a huge amount of sludge that has to be dealt with. And the other site is one that's been recently named a super fun site over at Creed, the Nelson Tunnel site, which as opposed to a watershed we've simply Dre named the Nelson Tunnel as the site, which instead of a 400 square mile watershed, it's a two mile long <coughs> tunnel that's nine feet wide. And so we are now dealing with the investigation and working on that site in above Creed. The first thing that we had to do in managing the cleanup there was in 2005, they had a large storm event and Willow Creek flooded significantly as it goes down through the waste rock associated with the Nelson Commodore mine. And uh, it's been unstable since they first put the waste rock there in the uh, banks of the creek, but this really accelerated things. 
And so the EPA's emergency response group, or what we call the removal program, uh, rebuilt the stream and uh, stabilized that so we no longer had the continuous ongoing erosion of waste rock into the Willow Creek and on down to the Rio Grande. So then the next piece that we're charged with is the Nelson Tunnel system itself, which has three, uh, three separate mine pools with the portal, the midsection, and the back section. And uh, I can make my short talk brief, briefer because of the work or the talk that Corey and Bruce gave about bulkheads and uh, isotope work and trying to fingerprint the uh, source of the water. <clears throat> but we're looking at, as opposed to RICO, which has fresh new water coming into it, <clears throat> the uh, Nelson Tunnel water is something between six 60 years and 100,000 years old, meaning it doesn't have any of the bomb, bomb tritium water in it. But some of the isotope work shows that it is very deep old water associated with the uh, Creed Caldera. And so we don't, don't have sources or clean sources <coughs> that we can cut off what we're looking at. And again, we're trying to figure out managing the water before we jump into treatment. And so we've got trying to go, go in with the, <coughs> into the ore body or into the uh, mountain, which in between the faults, we have very tight volcanic tough rock. And so the pathways for that convey the water to the Nelson Tunnel are uh, the primary are gonna be through these faults and fractures. The uh, Nelson Tunnel flow is driven along the Amethyst Fault. We see most of the water, we believe, coming in where this OH vein fault comes in. Now we also have <coughs> Homestake Mining, mine the Bulldog Fault <coughs> up until, I believe, 1983. They <coughs> have uh, completed their reclamation, and now Hecla Mining is back up in the district doing some very extensive exploration work and identifying the ore body and are planning to uh, reopen the Bulldog Mine. And when the Nelson Tunnel was <coughs> flowing water out into Willow Creek, <coughs> or when the Bulldog was being dewatered by Homestake, the flows out of the Nelson all but uh, disappeared. And so we're now talking with Hecla. They're looking at, again, dewatering the Bulldog and uh, going back into that ore body and they'll be going in deeper to an ore body deeper than 9,100 feet or the level of the Nelson Tunnel. So we have the mining company may provide our remedy for us, but of course it's only a short term because it's only going to be for the life of the mine. So we are in discussions with Hecla to uh, coordinate their mining operations with our need to maintain the Nelson Tunnel flows so we could continue for you know the long term to address the uh, water quality impacts to the Rio Grande. And it's <clears throat> right now since at the very beginning what we're planning to do this summer is in between the Bulldog and the Amasis Fault, <clears throat> well, I'm <clears throat> putting together a contract now to uh, drill into the OH vein to intercept that water before it goes into the Bulldog or the uh, the Amasis Fault and see both because this water has not had time to work with the <coughs> sludge or with the air and the sulfides in the Nelson. It may be clean water. We don't, I don't, we don't know if anybody's tested the water before it goes into the mine working. So we're going to intercept that water, look at the water quality and look at the possibility of pumping, <coughs> intercepting that water before it does go into the Bulldog or, uh, Amos, or the Amasis Fault, and that might be our remedy, and uh, we'll see where it goes. You know, like Bruce said, bulkheading is the first option. We looked at bulkheading, and because of the number of mines and because the Nelson is <coughs> on fault, this one doesn't lend itself for bulkheading, so, the options are water management by intercepting that water or keeping the water level below the Nelson 
or going into the treatment. So we are somewhat limited in those options, but that's kind of where we're at in these early stages of it. I just wanted to put this slide up real quick because we have done the synoptic sampling of Willow Creek down to the Rio Grande and the big thing to look at here, this is, this is for zinc as it's going down. <clears throat> These are the different sampling stations going down to the confluence with the Rio Grande and then the zinc concentrations. And <clears throat> right here we see that this is the Nelson load. So even if the Nelson load is taken out, you still will have a significant load in uh, <clears throat> the watershed that will need to be addressed to meet the long-term water quality standards. And that's why a lot of these talks keep hitting on the same thing, that it's not just focusing on one or two sources, but the entire watershed. And I'm being told to stop, so thank you very much.